Hi, everyone. And welcome again to my audiovisual channel. My name is Gabrielle Handel, and I'm a draftsman and also the host of the show, A Conversation About Art. During each episode, I look for the meaning of art and beauty through conversations with colleagues in different artistic fields. Today, I offer you episode 68, and I will talk with artist Mario Robinson. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by liking and sharing this video and also by subscribing to my audiovisual channel. These are all immediate and at no additional cost to you. If you'd like to show your support with money, it's also very welcome and appreciated. You can do so by purchasing my drawings directly from my website, which is just gabriellahandle.com, one word. You can purchase crafts I make from eBay by prints of my drawings or leaving me a tip. Thank you for your time and attention in watching this episode, and do leave a comment so I know you were here. I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, Mario Roberts, Robinson, thank you very much uh, for agreeing to talk to me today for my podcast, The Conversation About Art. You are episode 68. Please tell our future listeners and viewers who you are and what you do. Thank you, first of all, for having me. Um, I am Mario Andres Robinson. I am consider myself um, an American realist painter. I've been painting professionally since 1994. That puts it at 28 years straight. Um, I graduated while I was in the US Army straight out of high school. Then I went on from there to study at Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and it's been a long winding road, but yeah. we find ourselves here. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I work, I work in a few mediums. I work primarily in watercolor these days, um, oil paint, and I uh, managed to do some drawing here and there. And I wrote a little book in 2015 called Lessons in Realistic Watercolor, mm -hmm. um, published by Monticelli Press. Distributed by Penguin Random House. What? Uh, yes. Nice. Yes, it was it was in the Met. It was uh the Farnsworth Museum. That little book was at the National Gallery of Art. It was it was everywhere. You know, That's when you're really a new cool. author. It was really cool. That yeah. was one of the coolest parts, you know. Um, when you write a book and you put it out there, you get letters from people that like the book. Then you get people holding it up at different museums, and <laughs> I found it um in that's all the different countries so that's the long and short of uh what i consider myself to be um i teach I've shot videos um structural videos and you know i'm an artist by mm -hmm. trade mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. just okay. say all right well that is a lot of experience first of all from 1994 almost 30 years um also thank you for your service Oh yes, um, yes, yeah. Yes. So, so your artistic pursuit overlapped with uh, like being deployed. Uh, I, I look younger than I am. Uh -huh. um, I went into the army in 1986, which yeah. is considered a cold. Yeah, during the Cold War, so there was no, there were no, um, you know, engagements at that time. Mm. So I had a nice, smooth uh, four years. Uh, unlike one of your other guests, um, which I loved hearing. Um, how he's using art to kind of merge into civilian life. Me, mm -hmm. I didn't, it was a more smooth transition. Okay. So I write in my book, in the intro of my book, um, and I've told this story many times. And I think a lot of artists can identify with the fact that my parents weren't too thrilled um, about the unknown of the art world. Mm -hmm. So when I told them I wanted to go to art school um, in New York City, um, that presented a couple of problems you know number one at that time new york city um wasn't the safest place right and number two art isn't the the most reliable profession known to man mm -hmm. um, so i went to into the army right out of high school at 18 and then i went from there to pred institute okay um i surprisingly find it refreshing that your that uh your parents reaction to your wanting to study art because i feel like most of the guests that i've had so far their parents have been like really really supportive and i mean my parents were also supportive 
uh, nobody was like, oh, you know, what are you going to eat? And um, where are you going to live? You know, I mean, this this type of stuff. But it was like the feeling was rather within me because it's like, because the stigma of it is, I don't know, a cultural thing. I don't know. It's like the stereotype. Uh, for whatever reason, the artists that ended up being just, just having terrible lives and stuff somehow are really, really popular or something. I don't know. <laughs> but but uh, it was it was definitely difficult for me to end up choosing to study art because of that like fear. It's like I don't know what I'm gonna do. It's like I you know arguably I still don't know what I'm gonna do like in the present, you know, <laughs> in a way. Um. So so yeah, I find that kind of refreshing. So um, how did you? I mean, did you have to? Ver did you like verbally convince your parents, or did you like prove to them that? that you know it's like no i mean it's a career like any other career um i'll show you look yeah. <laughs> you know how, how did that go yeah you know and I, I love these conversations because it's it it allows you to reminisce and you can kind of oversimplify a lot of the the situations the tense moments um so it it was the verbal thing didn't go over too well because it during that period in the 80s parents were at least my parents were a little bit more strict. We grew up, grew up Christian. My stepdad was a pastor in his twenties. Um, he was in Vietnam mm -hmm. when he came back. Um, he at that time, army man too. huh? He was also an army man. He was an air force. Uh, yeah, he yeah. was. He was. Uh, he fixed C one thirties. He was a mechanic in the air force. Mm -hmm. So um, that's how he met my mom. Um, I was born in Oklahoma in a small town where the Air Force Base was, and he was from New Jersey, um, and he was stationed um, in in Oklahoma, in Altus. And uh, when he got out of Vietnam, we went back to where he was from in New Jersey. Um, so to answer your, answer your question, at that time, there wasn't a lot of convincing. They wouldn't have, it wasn't a back and forth at that mm -hmm. time. Mm -hmm. It was more of to the latter, um, convincing, getting a trade, going into the army, doing the things, and then coming out as an adult and um, going forth on my own. I received a full scholarship to Pratt, which mm -hmm. enabled me to be a little bit more independent yeah. in my choice. Um, that helped. But um, it was, you know, and this, I think to you're young, but to put it in perspective, you know, we didn't have a lot of research opportunities as far as what people are doing success stories maybe even in new york city which is on, was only like 40 minutes away mm -hmm. i couldn't get on the internet and say hey ma this person's an artist yeah yeah, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> it was basically books and magazines and art history like mm -hmm. and like you said um the examples i would have thrown up there would have been you know a guy to cut his ear off yeah uh, maybe toulouse Lautrec hanging out <laughs> in a bar in paris yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> so um i'm always encouraged by conversations with younger artists because the landscape of this contemporary art world has been built up a little bit more as to mm -hmm. where the conversation can be a little bit more um kind of fact-based and uh really intellectual mm -hmm. you know because you have a second generation you start with Bert Silverman in our area um or tri-state person so Jacob Collins Bert Silverman, mm. Daniel Graves, um, people that have paved the way and started schools, taught at the Art Students League. And then you have a second generation, people that are teaching at Grand Central Atelier or um, making making a living, not just doing illustration, making a living. So the conversation probably is a little bit easier for you to come from a flyover state mm. and say, why am I going to invest in this idea that you have to go to Philadelphia or New York? or even Florence, mm. it's a different conversation. So my situation was more of convincing, being stubborn and uh, couch surfing, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because they they didn't understand it. You know, I would get art materials for Christmas and stuff like that. They would support it up to a point. But like as a hobby, maybe. It was a hobby and it was a kind of like, oh, that's, that's neat. Go away. You know, you made something look like something. You're drawing, and um, I drew obsessively. So mm. it was just like this weird thing that they thought would eventually stop. 
So um, they kind of saw it like as a phase, you think? I think they were hoping it was a phase. Uh -huh. They they saw how serious it was. Like my, I ended up at Pratt Institute because my um, talent was kind of discovered in fifth grade. And I was entered into a talented and gifted program at, in sixth grade. And my art teacher, um, her dream school was Pratt Institute and she could never, mm -hmm. she never got accepted. So it was kind of, it wasn't her life mission, but she was like, Maybe we can build a portfolio and you you can have a shot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I worked with her for about six years and that's how I got the, you know, the scholarship. And she came to my parents, she came to the house and was trying to convince my parents, like, this is serious. Um, let me take them to Portfolio Day in Brooklyn, which is crazy going back in my head, like, here we are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I think I might have been 15 and we're in Brooklyn and I'm on the campus with her. Um, but she was a big proponent and we still communicate to this day. She writes me on this on Facebook and I shameless plug. I was just in an auction at Sotheby's and she was like, I don't believe this. I mean, this is full circle. This is abs like, we thought Pratt was the bigger thing, yeah, you yeah. know, at that time. <laughs> and then my career has, you know, I've been kind of busy and doing, doing stuff. So every time she sees something, um, never in her wildest dream as an art teacher, would she have, or me, uh, I would have, I don't know, I wouldn't have guessed that. That's really happened. cool. Yeah. That's really Maybe. cool. Yeah. And I think my biggest thing, just to wrap, round sure. this out, from myself to my parents, to Mrs. Elvinger, the art teacher, and my family and friends, um, I really invested a lot into this. So mm -hmm. to not wait, have their time wasted and for them to say, wow, this guy really, you know, had us fooled for a long time. And uh, we supported him. He thought it was going to be something that plateaued and really didn't go anywhere. <laughs> um, that's that, that that was my driving force in the beginning. Now, now it's just about a matter of sustaining what I have. But um, getting up that hill was a lot of, I had a lot of support, a lot of people that really invested in what I was doing. Yeah. yeah yeah what an awesome story that's really cool nice work, <laughs> <laughs> Good work. nicely done <laughs> work. yeah and yeah it, yeah, it is you a, earned it yourself did, you know I feel like you know my story is very unique because when I hear other people's stories they they're unique unto themselves um right. me, me as a person um we know the facts we know that that brown people are 13 percent um of the population and in that in that percentage in each individual business or uh, profession especially something like the art world you're gonna have a really small sample size so okay. um, i'm not i'm not ashamed to say that it's super unlikely that i would be in some of the circles and doing the things that i've been fortunate enough to be, be able to do over the decades you know um, okay, so I want to now talk a little bit about what you said about the mediums that you use, because you it seems like you gravitate most often to watercolor and oil painting. Is mm -hmm. that right? Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so, all right. All right, give me a second. Um, mm -hmm. Sure. Why, I mean, why these two? I, I like the relationship between the two in the sense that you know how oil and water don't mix, you know, like the expression. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and also, I mean, because, you know, in that in, in, in that sense, it's like they're almost opposites in a way. Uh, I, I have the perception, similar to like the perception of the artistic career, that mm -hmm. watercolor is kind of unwieldy and has like a life of its own or something, or a will of its own or this type of stuff. Versus, you know, and I'm not that familiar with either one, but I, with um, watercolor or oil, but I kind of feel if I was to pick one of them, or if I was to try either one, I feel, I feel more capable and confident with oil paint, mm -hmm. uh, even though I don't have that much experience with that either. But I'm curious about, you know, why do you think you like landed in quotes uh, in these two mediums and what do you like about each one? You know, like why, why do you have two preferred mediums instead of two, instead of like just the one, you know? 
Oh, good questions. Really good questions. Uh, yeah. So these are questions I would, if I was asking the outside in, I would, I would have asked all that from, <laughs> from the inside out. Um, me, I think about, I think about storytelling. I think about those pe very people that I just mentioned, um, that were in my life, the stories to be told, um, just the resilience um, that the people at the church had, um, the values that they instilled in me. And um, these were my quote unquote art models, my parents, um, the places that we that we loved, um, going to the beach. Um, so I start there. And then I start to um, kind of formulate a plan as to aesthetically what's what's going to bring this thing to bear. So the first 10 years of my career, I was painting pastels. And um, and he, this gets to the why. Um, I was trained in oil at, at Pratt Institute. We would go to the Met and my painting teacher, Tom Orlando, would teach us, you know, classical painting um, techniques. But then in the summers, when I would go home, my mom really didn't want the fumes and stuff in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a friend that introduced me to pastel. So I would do that in the summers for, and I liked it. So I started these cross hatching um, kind of techniques. And that's how I got kind of known in the magazine and stuff like that and sold some stuff in, in galleries. And then, you know, carpal tunnel set in and it just got a little untenable because I'm kind of ambidextrous and, and it, my wrist would just get burnt out from all the mm -hmm. pinching of little bitty pastels. Mm -hmm. And I always looked at Winslow Homer's work as kind of like a mm -hmm. guiding light. Um, then I discovered Andrew Wyeth's work and just the light that they were capturing in watercolor. I just couldn't get with the pastel or the oil. So um I made the decision in 2001 to move over to try watercolor. And uh, it wasn't great in the beginning. I was mixing pastel and watercolor to make it kind of look like something. Mm. Um, but aesthetically, um, since I was painting most of my scenes and portraits outdoors, it just made more sense to move over to watercolor because, you know, if you look at a watercolor, you're starting with the the highest in the color key you're starting with those whites you're starting with with those highlights and then you're working back down to your mid-tones and then your darks so you can exploit let's just say if you want the most beautiful cloud that you ever wanted you don't have to build up and muddy it up like you do with other mediums so i'm attracted to light gabriella i love the striking um, light on the side of a let's just say a clapboard house i can't get that um with other other mediums the way I can with watercolor and then with oil man it's almost like a break from watercolor mm -hmm. because like you said water, watercolor is very unruly and it takes a lot of planning mm -hmm. and it takes um it's like a high wire act without any net below mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so I'm 50% focused on what I just told you I love the storytelling and the people but I'm 50% chasing like a petulant child around all day, hurting uh -huh. <laughs> cats. Yeah, so yeah. I'm trying to do something serious and tell, tell a story the best I can. But then I'm just like trying to avoid potholes and landmines. So it, it, it's nerve wracking. Um, oil allows me to tell my story and do what I want to do um, with a little bit more of a relaxed way of going about it. And um, I like the way oil looks mm. um, for certain things, the depth of it. Um, it's almost like keys on a on a piano. It's like mm. you have those high singing notes, things those deep, deep chords. Mm -hmm. And if you have something aesthetically that you want to capture, um, I just move over to oil and bang it out that way. So mm -hmm. storytelling's first. And I think when people look at my work, they'll understand what I'm saying. Um, I'm not so much into the technical into the material as i am with um what the viewer is gonna 
encounter what they're going to hopefully feel image wise um, okay so so you do both landscape and figure with both uh watercolor yes. and oil okay yes um i'm not a big fan of because it makes me laugh when people try to time you to the classical thing i'm not classically trained i like looking at some classical work but I'm not a big fan of just a person, a floating head or something with the wall in the background or just nothing back there. I love, maybe because I like the American realists, I love the American landscape. I love people in the landscape. And if people aren't gonna be in that landscape, I like the landscape. Um, being inside, painting people inside, constructing, just posed and tight doesn't get me me there um people are interesting to look at i think that's a good study but that's not how we see each other mm -hmm. other um and there's something about the way light informs a flesh tone um or strikes clothing mm -hmm. that never left me when i first saw winslow homer and even thomas aiken's work and a lot of those great paintings were done um, outdoors. Um, and even the interiors have striking light. And then people are doing something. They're playing a banjo or they're playing or they're playing a game, maybe chess or something. But mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of just someone sitting there uh, like a commission painting. It <laughs> bores me to tears. <laughs> okay. But then, but then, so the artistic study that you did at Pratt wasn't there was no like classical type or like atelier style um it was, I mean, go ahead sorry no was that your question was it atelier style what, yeah yeah um, I mean I guess it's just that I guess I wonder I mean I guess because of what you were saying that you don't want to be you don't want to kind of be included into like you don't care for the label I guess of classical imagery or whatever so so I guess um uh, I was just curious if you had any any of that style of teaching like atelier style teaching at any point like during in Pratt or afterwards yeah yeah I I, I really like the structure I like the um the work that comes out of the the schools I've even taught at the Florence Academy of Art mm -hmm. um, it would just be disingenuous for me to say that's how I was trained because I was not. Mm -hmm. um, and Pratt Institute, even to this day, has a more contemporary bent. Um, and back then, in 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 the '90s, it was more of um, you know, modern art was was <laughs> ruling the day. And my teacher was a little bit of a rebel because our drawing classes were from life. But we did a lot of gestural stuff, a lot of quick poses, a lot of um, um, just squirrely lines, just, just get a gesture. They didn't really love the staunch realism. Um, so I got my realism really in in art history class. Um, and then Tom Orlando kind of snuck in some kind of uh, classical kind of techniques when we would go to the Met. And, he loved that kind of kind of work. I don't even know why he was teaching at Pratt because Pratt was more of color theory and that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So my friends, um, I was lucky enough to, when I moved to into the dorm, the freshman dorms weren't ready. So I moved into um, the junior and senior dorms, which is big high rise. So I was hanging around, um, you know, upperclassmen. They would draw at night and get models. And we did a lot on our own. So we could we could slow down and kind of paint and draw what we were seeing mm -hmm. um, you know so I had access to a to a studio and we could do that um, but it was a different time than it is now you know the, the art students league was doing that kind of stuff but the institutions were mostly like graphic design mm -hmm. illustration that kind of thing fine art was you know you're coming out of the Warhol era mm -hmm. in New York City I mean, Pratt, Manhattan, when I studied, I would go into Pratt because they had a Manhattan and Brooklyn location. And the Pratt, Manhattan um, school look, overlooked 
Keith Haring's studio. So we could look out the window and, you know, watch him paint and do what he was doing. <laughs> so that's, that's cool. That's what was big in that day. <laughs> mm, yeah, yeah. That's what was being really being pushed, graffiti and that kind of stuff. So we're in a we're in a good renaissance now. Mm. Um, and I, I think that it's hard to appreciate for younger artists because they think ateliers have been here <laughs> forever. <laughs> But Jacob Collins was doing something. He was cutting across the grain with Water Street when he introduced that because it was like, whoa, you know, he's drawing a painting from cast and trying to introduce something that was kind of lost, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I definitely have an idea of that whole situation in the 80s, not just of like New York being like crazy, like in the movies, uh, terrifying, like in the movies, <laughs> but also... Um, the the artistic scene of um they're you know coming after the modernists and the postmodernists of being like oh anti-art and all of this stuff and then people wanting because i i remember it's like i think that's one of the few people i know uh out of like i don't know that much art history but eric fischel who was just mm. like hinting at figures in his in his paintings and people were like what are you doing that's old idiot you know it's like it's yeah. like, I mean, why, you know, <laughs> it seems weird to think about this attitude, especially if it's like, oh, the rebels and stuff, because it's like, you know, if you're, if, if what the, if the argument for that modern, modernist stuff or whatever was like, you know, we want to draw whatever we want to draw and paint, whatever we want. It's like, don't be so dogmatic with the salon and stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. I like, I get that it's a breakout from that excessive uh, constraint and order. But then it's like you turn around and you become like those very same dogmatic people. And it's like, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's my, in my opinion, it's hypocritical because, you know, you're acting like your shit don't stink, you know, um, that's, yeah. uh, and it's like, I don't know, I guess at the same time, it's, it's, it's also like this thing about doing something and it's, it sucks when you do it, but when I do it, it's cool. Or something, you know. Anyway, it's like a, it's a, that's like a little ranty thing there, but it, it it's also kind of funny, you know. Um, but it's it's cool. You're like, yeah, I have heard the term the atelier movement because indeed after Jacob Collins, who I would like to have on the podcast, by the way, but I haven't been able to find an email. Um, yeah. He apparently he was just like super subversive by putting an atelier and teaching this classical stuff. Oh, drawing from life and painting from life and studying casts. And mm -hmm. now, you know, you can name several, several ateliers, you know, to here and in other countries and just, it's every, it's, that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I would like it if there could be some kind of balance struck of, you know. Good luck. Good luck. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Wish you. <laughs> you said the word though. You said the word dogmatic. Oh. Um, the problem is... Uh, we're human beings and human beings feel comfortable um, largely fitting in mm -hmm. uh, in groups in packs as I like to call them um, and when you have a movement then you do start to kind of assimilate and kind of live behind like uh, gated communities if you will mm -hmm. so we do it like this and this is the only way. And if mm. you do it like that, um, you know, you're out, you're other. Mm. Um, so there's, it's, I don't know, you know, because I try to keep myself as removed um, from movements. That's why I gave the disclaimer. I don't want anybody, because it's been said that I'm <laughs> classically trained artist and get assigned all these different as I go along in my journey I get attached things get attached to me that just mm. aren't they're assumed they're not true mm. um, I have a very individual style um, a lot of it is self-taught even though I you know I graduated from Pratt I did a lot of things on my own they didn't teach watercolor they didn't teach pastel um, and the way I paint in oil is not the way I was was taught mm. I I learned a lot of chemistry. I know how to, you know, what the medium does, what the materials can do. But as far as my style, 
I like to keep myself as separate and apart mm -hmm. from big movements because when you search Instagram and you scroll, a lot of things look the same. Mm -hmm. I can tell because I'm only because I've been in it so long, like where people studied, mm -hmm. like who are their teachers, mm -hmm. um, even the generations of different schools. Nice. I just, yeah, I just know. I know this is a Water Street person. <laughs> I know they're over. I know they're over 40 <laughs> and I <laughs> and they study with the person that study with that person. And it's and to me, at some point, um, you have to break free of the pact and you have to start. And some people have I've seen people use more color than maybe this school uses or mm -hmm. you know, paint a landscape, you know, not just be in the studio. So it's a cautionary tale, you know, when you study with someone and you learn. Um, and we've had these conversations with people that have studied at the Florence Academy and GCA and other schools. You have to find your your voice. Mm -hmm. um, and even if it's not the style that you're drawing and painting, just the imagery, the subject yeah. matter, what do you care about? Mm -hmm. Even if it's in the tradition, what are you painting that other people aren't painting? We're all painting the same art model. I get that. Um, and that's one thing I like about the New York Academy, because I've taught there for two semesters now. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of individuality. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of cross pollination. There's a lot of inspiration from somebody that's doing something different than what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And you can see it from studio to studio. Yeah, right in the next studio. Yeah. You went there. You you know yeah. of what I speak. Yes. See, that that's a lot like Pratt a little bit. Um because there's there's a suggestion of contemporary um, ideals, but there's no like start this way, mm. finish this way. Mm. There's a lot of cross pollination even from other majors because they don't just have art. They have industrial design, they have architecture, they have illustration. Um, so, mm. okay, okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, um, Mr. Robinson, then, um, but what is art in your opinion? It varies from person to person. If we're talking about visual art, um, I'm not as I'm not as open maybe as I should be. Uh, it's something it's created by a person, moves you. Um, I don't care if it's negative or positive. Um, or even melancholy um it's 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 art um when we talk about drawing and painting um i think the moment that that your intellectualism meets the material um and you're doing it it doesn't even have to be in a creative way um just a whatever you feel, it becomes art. Now, there's a difference between art and um, commodity. Mm -hmm. When we get into high art and commodity, um, there's more expectation. Like a monkey has been known to create art mm -hmm. because of those two very ingredients. There's a, some intellectualism, even if it's intuitive and there's material. But when we talk about what is art that can be commodified, um, it gets weird. It gets crazy. Um, what does it mean to commodify art? Um, it's kind of putting art in a box, putting it in a holding cell, putting it in handcuffs, um, because the artist now starts to go from what I just described of just anything or just being free to now I have to meet certain standards. Um, even if that standard is something as simple as um, working with materials that are archival. Um, you there's a lot of pressure. We all talk about the freedom of being a child when we first started doing this. We go mm -hmm. from that first category that I just described, anything, to now we lose a lot of that childlike expression because we have to support ourselves. 
we have to make it appealing to someone else. Um, and it can be a gilded cage. So when you commodify art, when you say this, I created this and this is $10. There's an expectation for my $10. Now I get a voice in what Gabriella has created because you're largely performing for me and us. And you are now asking something of us. So now what we get to ask of you is let it be worthy of my $10. Mm -hmm. And the higher you go from there, you go from 10 to 100, you go from 100 to 1,000. Um, now you're in a bigger pond. You're you're over there with people that have been painting for 20 and 30 years because they're mm -hmm. charging the same future. They're charging $1,000. Mm -hmm. um, so, so does art become commodified when money is involved? Yes. Yes, Commod commodity is large. Com commodity commodities can either be traded or they can be purchased. So there's no way for... Um, there not to be an exchange mm -hmm. so if you create you you create art i don't know if you're an artist if you're just giving everything away that you create like if you if you create something you give it away and you say oh, i just create that's that's a gift mm -hmm. that's a donation mm -hmm. um and this is this is this is largely where I've kind of diverged and pulled all of my work out of every gallery except for one in Washington, D.C., which has a couple of older pieces mm -hmm. because galleries become partakers in that exchange. And you'll hear artists complain or rightly so because um, there are some good relationships with galleries and collectors, but... Here's an example. Have you ever painted something and, and sold it? And then either you or another person wishes that you paint another one um, similar. So it can kind of be a guaranteed sell. I know artists that have, and I have. Mm -hmm. um, so when you're dealing with other people, whether it's a collector or, or a gallery, um, you have to be careful because you can all, you can start to become kind of like a machine mm -hmm. if you're not careful. And then every thought that you're thinking going into every single piece is an exchange mm -hmm. of commerce. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. Mm -hmm. I mean, but I feel like there there should be a difference between an artist, because I know for sure at least one person, uh, 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 at least one fellow artist who indeed, cause, and I mean, that's like, that's kind of what I am understanding, a uh, part of what I'm understanding of the trap of get either getting into a gallery or you post it on Instagram, a drawing or a painting, and you know, say that you're painting uh, por profile portraits and because you're, you want to draw profile portraits uh, for a little while because you think they're cool and mm -hmm. they happen to be selling a lot either on Instagram or on the gallery and the gal gallery is like, oh my God, yeah, keep doing these. They're awesome. And then one day you're like, I kind of want to do three quarter portraits now. I want to explore those now. And then maybe the Instagram wasn't reacting the same way and or the gallery was like yeah no don't do that go back keep doing the port the profile ones um and so like then then it's up to the artist to either continue with their whim of like no i'm gonna draw the three-quarter portraits because that's what i want to draw now or mm -hmm. they can choose to be like all right i guess i mean you know that's what's selling i have to pay the rent i have to sustain myself uh you know and i don't want to teach or something um and I feel like there's a discursion between those two situations because, for example, I mean, I have no problem with selling my work. <laughs> I want to sell my work. It's like what I want to do is I want to draw whatever the hell I want. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just unfettered. 
draw mm-hmm. whatever I want, however I want it, whatever size, whatever it is. And then I want to be able to sell that. And I want that to, I want the money. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I don't want to, it's like, it's like, you know, I act, I mused about this in a previous episode in like the relationship in like, in like what part of the art that we do, do we try to, you know, have it, like you were saying, make it, have it sustain you because, um, I don't see, like, in my opinion, it's not a negative thing, but I have heard it associated in a negative way because of the relationship, because of the impression that we have of work, or like the toil of nine to five, Monday to Saturday, the cubicle, the um, tippy tappy and the computer. It's like, that is a negative association. But at the same time, um, if, you know, there's also the association that work is what allows you, you know, whatever form the work take that takes that is what allows you to have uh what is arguably a dignified life you know you can pay your rent you can have a roof over your head you can get food you can have a bed you can have clothes uh these things you know so you know however whichever way the artist chooses to obtain that whether it is by teaching and not selling the work or whether it is by kind of like submitting in quotes to the will of the gallery or the Instagram and continuing to make work and like, like choosing to be trapped basically, or whether, you know, you find another way to make the money and then, you know, like maybe like me and then draw what other shit I want and then hope that somebody will want that or like organize myself some whole other way. Um, I don't know. What do you think about that? <laughs> Not sure exactly where I was going, but tell me what you think. Cause it's related. Yeah, I was listening. You, you're you're onto something. You you offered a couple of, of of options that are, yeah, that that artists really should be thinking about. Um, I, I was just listening, but I would say in my case, um, I think I was just naive. I was I was young and dumb, and um, I didn't think that far ahead um, when I was studying. Um, I just thought that if I put my heart and soul into something and I painted it, um, number one, I would make myself proud and it's because it's a really selfish pursuit up until that point. Um, because, you know, my parents are largely paying the bill. So I didn't have that kind of pressure on myself. I should have of okay i paint it people are gonna understand in this country what art even is and and what it means to their lives and they need it so bad um and that's what i love about doing these these talks and getting different questions because um it forces me to go back and uh think about wow i, sh- I should have done that you know i I was so desperate to get out of school. Um, Spike Lee's office was about five blocks from Pride Institute in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was notorious for getting students to have their work, because it's cheap, um, in his movies. So he would build the elaborate brownstones and, and, and movie sets. So when I was there, he's working on a movie called More Better Blues. So we would be given directions to like actors, like Denzel Washington was like in the neighborhood. I didn't know who he was at that time, but I would bump into all these people. I was like, oh, Sp- Spike's, the set is that way. Um, Cause he built the whole street for, for this movie. Um, so my brilliant idea was like, I'm gonna paint a portrait of Spike in the summer, my off time. I did this huge pastel for a magazine I, I march it down there to the office, to 40 Acres in a Mule office, to the store. Mm-hmm. And his manager works there. His name's Earl Smith. And I was like, I did this for Spike. Mind you, he has a whole window full of like fan stuff that people, uh, you know, send, send him. So they just put it in the window. I didn't think this is fan art. <laughs> <laughs> when you're in, in, in college <laughs> and uh, yeah. Maybe even he'll put it in one of the movies. This is how naive I was about the art business. And then Earl, his, his manager was like, all right, I'll put it aside. And then I went back thinking, all right, 
don't get paid or does he want it? Or he's like, he wants you to paint another one. <laughs> so, uh-huh. yeah. He wants one for his uh, house up in um, Mount Vernon for his uh, fireplace. I was like, another one? Yeah, another self-portrait. I did another one, went back. And then it dawned on me when there was no exchange, right, of money, currency. Um, I had just created fan art. And that's the catalyst for me learning about the business of art. I had put my whole summer into these. Mm. Um, and it wasn't the only thing I was doing. I was working a great adventure like every day, like working on like screen machine and lightning loops, like operating um, roller coasters and then coming home and painting because I thought it was going to be some kind of exchange. Mm. So getting kind of like disappointed and realizing I have a long way to go because art and business are the most unlikely bedfellows that you can ever imagine. They don't match. They don't go together. I had to learn that lesson. I mean, these are like full sheet watercolor papers. I was creating pastels, like put a lot of work into it mm. and I get nothing. <laughs> That's crazy. So yeah, yeah. it made me realize how people undervalue um not just the art but the artists you know um so that that really let me know that I I have a lot of work to do when it comes to marketing when it comes to what I'm creating and how to reach out to learned individuals who have an expectation of not only collecting the work but paying for what they're collecting Mm. And then that came later. But yeah, I, I understand commission painters much more as I get older. I've never painted a commission, but do, I do understand the certainty um, of you paint it, you have a patron, and they pay you for it. Um, and the market likes predictability. So art market is just like anything else. Galleries want to know that if we sold one, you create another one, we can sell it. Mm-hmm. And that's how... I kind of stepped away from the galleries because when I started watercolors, I had been painting the pastels for, at that point, eight years. It had some really good shows in Charleston. And if you don't know about Charleston, Charleston, South Carolina is a just an art town. There are galleries upon galleries on, on almost every street downtown. Mm-hmm. And I did very well. And then I told the gallery I want to switch to watercolor. And you would think the world just blew up because they weren't that good at, at first. Mm. <laughs> and the gallery owner was like, I don't think this is your medium. Mm. And then I got a little better within a year. And then we had a sold out show of 15 watercolors in 2005 and 13 sold before the show. Nice. Um, so she called me on the way to the opening a few days like can you bring one more can you create one and bring another one because we got to have something to sh- sell at the mm. show so to that point um galleries and collectors they'll go with you but uh you have to fight for your rights you yeah, know yeah. they'll go along with what you ha- what you have going on but they have bills to pay you know sure i mean you so know. do we <laughs> Exactly, exactly. And that's on our end, we end up caving a little bit. We end up, but I'm pretty stubborn. The art comes first. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah. And, you know, and this whole thing about art and business, I, um, I, I, I am maybe, maybe unhelpfully uncompromising (laughs) because, or, you know, in a way that kind of sabotages what I said I want to do, which is to make whatever, draw whatever I want and then sell it and really make whatever I want. Cause I love to do like crafty shit with reusing whatever. I mean, it's anyway. Um, but it's like, in a way I probably am sabotaging myself by being so unrelenting in terms of what I want to make. But at the same time, um, I think the issue of finding the relationship between art and business and finding something, I mean, similarly to what you were saying actually earlier about a person looking for their voice and finding their voice 
Um, and kind of like also that being so available to us in the present because of the internet and TikTok and all of this stuff, it's like, I think it's a matter of finding or thinking or problem solving because that's kind of what we do all the time when we're making a, a drawing or a painting. It's like you're constantly problem solving to try to make the image look like what you want to, what you want it to look like. So there's yeah. also, it's like solving a puzzle. It's like, so mm -hmm. then the puzzle, like in my case would be, how can I make money with this specific requirement of mm -hmm. not kind of following a, a list of like subject matters that a gallery or whomever, or, you know, the popular subject matters that I think I should be doing in order to sell mm -hmm. um, and just draw whatever I want and figure out a way of selling them. I mean, I don't, it's like, it's like, what, what is a requirement? I don't want to compromise what I'm drawing. I want to draw, I want the drawings to be whatever I want um, and draw them whenever I want, you know? Um, and in a way it's like, like that tension also like a, as a further muse, like that tension between these two things that seem to not mix like oil and water um, is like, it's like that tension is, the producer of great things, even if it doesn't happen often, because again, it's like difficult to get them to mix. Yeah. You know, it can, something really cool can come from that. You know, there's, there's this uh, person on YouTube that I've been looking at because of her makeup tutorials that mm -hmm. she is a self-taught makeup artist and she does not put makeup on other people. All she does is videos of her painting herself. And she's like, I get these offers and stuff. And if I, and if the, if the email has mistakes, if I don't like their website, if I, this or that or the other, I don't accept, I <laughs> delete, you know? So it's like the, you know, the, the era we're in, I guess, with the informational stuff and Instagram and the internet, I think lends itself to, it's like a catalyst that will be able to make something happen between the oil and water of art and business. And I find that really exciting and it's like, you know, it's not that early for me either. I mean, I'm, I'm 40, I'm going to be 41 this month. And it's yeah. like, I am still trying to figure something out, um, yeah. you know, cause it's, it's not easy. Uh, like, you know, it's not easy to get oil and water to mix. No. Um, so yeah, I don't know. <laughs> you're at a great age because you're old enough and young enough, you know, you're mm -hmm. using, able to use the technology for something, um, coming from a mature mind. Um, and I, I think that you might be, yeah, you, you might, your, your generation, like the 40 and like right in there, 40, and maybe 40, just under 45 might be, you, 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 you're adults, you know, and yeah. it's okay if your mind is still, <laughs> your brain is still forming and you're 25 and you're, you know, you're young you, and using the technology and you know how to use it better than anybody, but what you're putting on there is, mm. is the thing. Uh, and just to round this conversation out, you know, I think artists, they just lose faith and don't trust fully in what they're doing. Mm. In my case, the, the, the art really made room for me at the table. Mm. I've, I focused on the work. I didn't look to the left or the right. Like when you look at my early work, you know, putting a bunch of African-American people, church people, um older people um in these images um and really being strident about what the articles were going to be about they're about the people when you look at the even the titles of some of the, the some of the articles like voice of the people and then i would talk about the people so i think art is like a trend like it's like fashion there are trends that'll come along but you can't follow the trends you just be committed to your work, whatever that is, and um, try to be, create the best product that you can. And then the marketing is easier. Mm, that's it's easier true. to market something of quality. Yeah. But you can't just be all over the place and following things and trying to make it look the most like somebody else's, even if it's a contemporary or, or historic figure. Trust what you're doing. Mm. You know, uh, it sounds kitsch, but you will actually stand out. No, I like that a lot in terms of uh, uh, an artist that is, I don't know, that indeed wants to make their their work, their art, their work. Um, that's really good. It's like, if you really want to do that, then yeah, trust trust that um, desire, that inward desire. Okay, 
Uh, I want to ask you mother, more stuff. Uh, Mr. Robinson, what is beauty in your opinion now? I have my own form of beauty. Oh, man. Um, as per our conversation um, a couple months ago, you know, trying to do this, you know, I lost my mom in January um, on the 9th. Loss. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate you being patient because I've been the last few months just grappling and, and just reminiscing and dealing with family stuff because of her loss. But when you when you talk about beauty, um it is it is not just a a, a visual thing. Be beauty strikes you like to your core. It hits you in your soul. Um, and, and there are many, there are many iterations and, and, and fake versions of, of beauty that are like the sweetest of, of, of candies. And we can mistake that for beauty, but, um, you know, it, when you encounter it, um, I used, my mom just used to make me laugh like, like no one else. Um, and she had a smile that was just like, it, it could melt you, no matter who you are. Um, she worked for the army for almost 30 years as a civilian, went to the, almost the top rank for a civilian um, and carried herself with absolute grace. Um, and when she walked in the room, it changed the energy. That That's beauty. I don't get caught up in this esoteric flat, just self-effacing shallowness. I really look for the beauty. It can be nature. It can be whatever you want it to be. That's just one form of, for me, beauty. And then I, I go from that to what my mom really gave me and what she exhibited on a daily basis. And then I, that defines beauty for me. See, I can't get caught up in other fake temporary um, versions of beauty. Um, and, and the kitsch thing, a sunrise, a sunset, whatever it is for you. Mm -hmm. But for me, what my mom gave me in character, um, discipline, love, um, right now, that that's what I'm on. I'm really looking back and seeing the value that she brought into my life and, and other people's lives. And for me, that that's just the epitome of beauty. That's just, you can't buy it. You can't make it up. You can't cover it up. Um, it really does something to you. Like it'll give you chills. You, it's just like, so when I paint her or I paint my grandmother or I, or I paint um, some of the people, the older women at church, older men at the church that had real character, things that I actually aspire to in my life. Um, ooh, Gabrielle is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen. People that actually are living through the travails, the ups and downs of life and still giving you quality, not only on the weekends um, at church, but throughout um, the week in their community. These people are uh, government workers. They're collecting your garbage. They are policemen, firemen. I had everything that run the gamut. Um, and everybody almost in my immediate circle served the country, whether it was the Navy, the Air Force, um, the Army. Um, that that to me, that's that's beauty. That's the definition of beauty. It's not an aesthetic thing for me. Mm. It's just beautiful to watch. It, it was poetry in motion. And when you look at my work, this is why my work um, kind of stands alone. Where in a, in an era um, where beauty is the obvious answer, beauty. <laughs> beauty is something aesthetically just visually pleasing and uh self-aggrandizing mm. self-fulfilling but yeah that's beauty and if i can capture that in a painting it'd be even more beautiful mm -hmm. it's just the gift that keeps on giving if i could trap that and capture that that's what i'm chasing that's what i'm chasing that beauty mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and there's beauty in ashes there is beauty in the most in in some of the the darkest dank corners um, that we just look over because we don't see that we don't we don't have that that um, 
a gauge to be able to say, that really is beautiful. But I'm looking for this surface, this beauty, where I think everybody is going to go for, you know? Um. Okay, yes. I like that a lot. I was thinking recently, or I was talking recently with somebody about this whole thing about health, you know, being healthy and taking care of yourself via, you know, whatever changes you do in your life. And the appearance of health, mm. which is like, you know, being skinny, I guess, something like mm -hmm. that, mm -hmm. which is usually associated with health. Mm -hmm. But I was thinking, you know, it, it, I was thinking or I was musing about how it's like the opposite of the chicken and the egg. Because in the in the case of the chicken and the egg, it's like, oh, who came first? I don't know. But like, I think we have it wrong with beauty, like uh, kind of like you were musing about that it it's the kind of like the overall actions and some inward type thing that you know, it's not just like a dictionary definition, but that within of the person kind of leads to them kind of looking beautiful mm, in a way yeah. or makes them seem beautiful, you know, because, yeah. it, you know, it's like the way that you were talking uh, about your mom or just like these uh, other individuals that you're surrounded by that you're just like, you're just like, you're amazing. You know, when you look at these people and you're just like, you're the best, you know? And it's like, that makes them uh, pleasing to look at or just one enjoys their company, their presence. And it isn't, like you were saying, it isn't, it isn't strictly the visual. And I think we tend to confuse because, you know, the result, like the end result is the pleasure we get from looking at the people at these individuals that are in amazing people but it isn't because they look in a way it's because of what's within them you mm -hmm. see what i'm saying so it's like i I'm, I'm starting to get to think that perhaps is it's it's a confusion of where the beauty is located and then the effect so it's located within the person and in the person's actions and this you know the behavior demeanor this type of stuff and mm -hmm. then that has an effect on their outward appearance so mm -hmm. the reason for which i brought up the health and beauty stuff is because if you have a person that is just unhappy and very unhealthy whatever they look at on the outside and then you have like the same person when they have a good life they're happy they're healthy good decisions the healthy version of them is obviously more attractive and more good looking yeah so it's like it's the the health leads to the good of to the pleasing appearance so likewise the inner beauty le leads to the pleasing out to what looks like an out pleasing outward appearance mm -hmm. um what do you what do you think about that yeah there's there's like a temporal version of of beauty that many people mm -hmm. are given largely in their youth and it's fleeting mm -hmm. and there's a transcendent beauty that transcends this physical appearance um, and the things that we do, the things that we stand for can affect people and make them look at us through the eyes of grace. Um, so you can be 60 years old and be beautiful. You can be mm -hmm. 80 years old and be absolutely beautiful. They used to say when I was younger, Beauty is only skin deep. And I didn't know what that meant at the time. Mm. Now I do. Um, and when you're born with a certain level of just a, I'm just going to say it, a European version of the beauty standard, you really don't have to be a lot of times a really good person. You can be, but you don't have to be. You get things, um, people assign things to you. There's something called the halo effect. And the halo effect connotes that people that are better looking are good people. 
that's what we do. We assign a halo effect. And um, me personally, um, you know, I like people that are resilient. I like people that are defying the odds. I like somebody to fail and then come back again and then just be better than they were um, before the fall. That's beauty. That's absolutely inspiring. It's beautiful. It's beautiful to watch. And um, beauty is, 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 it's a commodity like anything else. You can commodify it. You can use it. You can, um, you can even use it as a profession. You can use it to get a mate. You can do whatever you want, but it's fleeting. It's fleeting. There will always be another iteration that is younger, more vibrant, more beautiful than you are. So it's very important to work on your heart, your soul, your mind, and to your point, be healthy in all of those categories. Um, does you no good to be physically beautiful and be mentally ill? You have to be in alignment. Um, so beauty is a trap and it's being on these phones, on these apps, it's largely being, even with some of the filters, it's being bastardized because people know how attractive and alluring, um, the visual is. And unfortunately artists, we have to be on that app. So what are we doing? We're creating reels. We're creating things that attract people we're, we're using wizardry and music and everything else and we're getting further and further and further away from what our core belief is as an individual we're getting swept up into what the algorithm is saying that we put up there i just refuse to negotiate with terrorists i am going to be doing what i did when i came into this thing i'm going to use the technology for what it's for but I'm not going to let it rule what I'm doing. Just like I'm not going to let the galleries do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, um, I like this as the ending thoughts of the conversation, uh, Mr. Robinson, because we have broken the one hour mark. We're at one hour and five minutes now. Um, so I'm going to start closing it out. Why don't you tell our future listeners and viewers, what are you up to lately? Where your work can be found? Any projects you're excited about? You want to add anything? Um, so my work can be found on my website, which is Mario, A is an Apple, Robinson.com or on Instagram at Mario A. Robinson. Not on Facebook that much, but it's Mario A. Robinson as well. Um, what do I have coming up? Oof. Um, <laughs> Everything. <I'm>, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> now that we're coming out of this um, shutdown, um, yeah, things things are getting back to that pre-pandemic pace of 2018, uh, 2019. So I'm going to be doing a residency um on Nantucket um beginning on July 4th I'm gonna do two weeks there and then I'm gonna go to a another little island off of Massachusetts um in September called Cuddy Hunk and if you search out Cuddy Hunk um residency you can find it or Nantucket um the Art Association of Nantucket if you want to join me at any, either one of those places. Um, then I have a Zoom class in June that I'm doing with um, the Winslow Art Center. Um, it's gonna be a two, it's two weeks, but it, it's two days. Um, I'm gonna be doing an oil um, class for them and then just other random stuff that I list on my website. Um, yeah, yeah, just just stuff. I'll be doing stuff, I'll be around. Lovely. Okay. Well, that sounds excellent. Nice work being busy and always, <laughs> always making stuff and putting more things out. Okay. So, all right. Uh, thank you everyone for watching and listening. Special thanks to my guest, Mario, for agreeing to talk to me today and for his time. If you'd like to support Mario, my podcast, myself, or all three, all corresponding links will be in the caption. Make sure you like this video and leave a comment so we know you were with us. 
Also remember to subscribe to my audiovisual channel. Thank you everyone and see you next time. Bye.